If you assembled a group of people and asked them to describe a portable cassette player, it's more than likely they'd tell you about a Walkman or a boombox. However, if you asked the same group to describe a high-end cassette recorder, they'd probably tell you about a hi-fi component. However, there is one type of cassette recorder that's both those things. It's high-end and it's portable, and no surprise, I've got one here today to show you. This is the Sony TC-D5. Let's take a look at it. Now the Sony TC-D5 isn't just one cassette model, it's a total of four. The version I've got here is the Pro 2. This is the last revision. However, the original one that came out in 1978 was just called the TC-D5. That was revised in 1980 to the TC-D5M, which meant it could record onto metal tapes. That one carried on being sold until 2005 approximately. But it forked in 1982. There was a Pro model issued, which had XLR microphone inputs and that was revised in 1986 and carried on to some time around about 1999 or maybe a little bit beyond there. So putting aside the more technical differences for the moment, things like different record heads and microphone amplification circuitry, things like that, your average chap in the street is more interested in the fact that your Pro and Pro 2 only have XLR mic level inputs, whereas the prosumer versions, the original and the M, have line level RCA inputs and outputs of course. Let's just take a step back for the moment and talk about field recorders in general because they are still in use. Of course, nowadays people tend to use digital ones. Some of these microphones will be for radio stations. They don't need to record video, so they just record onto a digital recorder. And the same would have gone for back in the 80s. People would have been using cassette recorders for that purpose. It was perfectly acceptable to use them for radio broadcasts. The quality was good enough for that. Of course, before then, people used reel-to-reel -reel recorders and field recorders have existed pretty much as long as recorders recording itself has. Of course, back in the 60s and 70s, when TV news quite often relied on 16mm film, you'd have a separate sound chat recording the audio separate to the camera. But of course, later on, we started synchronising the video and the sound onto one device, so field recorders tended to be used more just for radio. It wasn't that long ago that I was interviewed in the street like this. I mean, not dressed up like a woman, like the comedian Dick Emery, but no, with a reporter coming up to me with a microphone in one hand, cassette recorder slung over their shoulder. That was for something on local radio news. At the time the D5 came out, many of the rivals were only capable of recording in mono. The D5 was capable of good quality stereo recording and therefore often puts a good use in the tapers section at a Grateful Dead concert. And another early adopter of the D5 was Sony co-founder Masaru Ibuka, who took one along with him on his business trips with a set of headphones to listen to classical music. It had a good long battery life, but it was a little bit bulky, and he mentioned this in early 1979 to Akio Morita, who was the chairman, and that resulted in Sony developing their first Walkman. So just think, if the D5 hadn't existed, perhaps the Walkman would never have happened. Sony called the TCD5 the ultimate portable cassette deck and kept using that tagline throughout its life, and it was a long life as well. Looking back through the old Sony catalogues, you can see the D5 there in the 1980s and the 1990s. All the other products in the catalogue completely changed during that time, whereas the D5 remains constant throughout. If it was a car, it would be like the Land Rover. It looked very similar to the models that came out decades before, but there was no need to change it because they got it right first time, and the same could be said for the D5. But when it comes to the normally fast-moving world of consumer electronics, the D5 is a bit of an anomaly. I mean, it was first launched in 1978 when the BBC were using reel-to-reel -reel recorders for their field work, and then it existed throughout the years of the Walkman and the small dictaphones and carried on throughout, all the way through into the 21st century. I've even found it mentioned in this B&H catalogue where you can find professional mini-disc recorders, DAT recorders, CDRs, hard drives, but alongside all those, it's still there, the D5 Pro 2. Now, the reason I chose the Pro 2 over the other models in the range is because it was the last revision. It actually came out in 1986. The D5M was last revised in 1980. Uh, the Pro 2 has a couple of improvements, such as the recording circuitry, 
better quality heads in there, a shield over the heads to stop interference from buzzing, things like that. But the Pro models were only generally available through specialist outlets like B&H. If you go on the Sony website, they still do Pro products. You've got to go past the normal consumer stuff down to the bottom here. You can see the Pro range and there's stuff really that is there for broadcasters. And if you have a look at some of the prices on this, you can see why they class it as Pro. For example, this point of view camera is $75,000. So yeah, you can see this Pro cassette recorder is designed for that market. It feels quality as well. The whole thing is made out of metal. There's a couple of bits of plastic here and there, but really the whole body and the structure of the thing is just solid. It's designed to take a kick and keep on recording. Along the bottom here, you can see this section is made out of a rubber, and that's a kind of protective bumper, because when you hold it on your side, if you were to drop it, that's the part it would land on. Even the battery compartment has a metal cover. Might not sound like a big deal, but very rare to see that. And the batteries inside here are two standard D cells, which will power it for approximately four and a half to five hours. There are, of course, advantages to using off-the-shelf batteries like these as opposed to having a rechargeable device especially if you've got your field recorder in the middle of nowhere somewhere where there's no power how do you recharge anything you can always carry along a few extra batteries with you though and also i noticed in this article that was about recording audio for the radio they mentioned that after the tsunami the only machine that was still working was the d5 when their more modern mini disc and dat machines had already given up I should also mention that both my Pro 2 model and the D5M can be run off DC power. However, I don't think the same goes for the original Pro, where mine's got a DC power jack that's got a stereo and mono switch. Right, so I want to show you something now. I've taken the Pro 2 outside. I've got something recorded on this cassette. I'm going to play it into the camera and uh, just have a listen to this for a moment. If you want to develop a professional field recorder, you can't just take a typical cassette mechanism and plonk it into a case along with some batteries. No, because as soon as you were to move it, the sound would become wobbly. This is due to variations in the tape speed. It's something more commonly referred to as wow and flutter. Shaking the D5, though, has no effect. The playback speed is unaltered, and this is thanks to a new type of drive mechanism that Sony developed just for this machine. This kind of performance was vital for a device that has to record broadcast quality audio, whether it's at a press conference sat on a table or slung over the shoulder of a reporter running through a war zone. Now, that really was quite impressive. Of course, nowadays, though, when people are listening to solid-state devices with no moving parts, it doesn't quite have the same impact. But when this thing came out, that was a bit of a revelation. It's all down to this very clever motor mechanism, which I can't even begin to explain to you because I don't quite understand it myself. But it's kind of a direct drive kind of thing. You've got a wheel, you've got another thing that's attached to the wheel, which drives it in a certain way that doesn't get affected by movement or gravity or things. All very clever and later on employed in the Sony D6C professional walkman as well but i can't really demonstrate it or show you how it works so let's just put the cover back on here but i will show you around the machine itself if we start off on the left hand side we can see we've got a little uh, part that's sticking out of there and that's to attach a strap to so you can put it over a shoulder there's one on the other side as well at the bottom corner, we've got a 6.5mm stereo headphone jack, and above that, there's a control to adjust the volume of that, which also affects the volume of the speaker on the top. It's just a mono speaker, really designed just for listening back to what you've recorded to check there's something there. It's not a high-quality speaker. The keys on this are the typical piano key design, which was popular in the 70s, later on replaced by the kind of touch logic controls. This is basic, but it's basic because it worked and it doesn't go wrong. Over on the right-hand side, we've got the twin VU meters for the left and right stereo and a couple of other controls I'll show you a little bit later on. There's no button to open the cassette door however once you've opened it manually you can see we've got a couple of additional lever switches in here one of which turns Dolby B on or off and then the other one selects tape formulations between type 1 and type 3. You might remember Type 3 being the shortly lived formulation that wasn't on the market all that long. However, this also automatically identifies Type 2, which is chrome tape from this little lever at the back. It can play back metal tapes, but it can't record to them. If you want to record to metal tapes, then you'll need the TCD5M, the M standing for metal. It's a bit unusual that the prosumer model can record to metal, whereas the professional model can't. 
and uh, some people say that's perhaps because you need more power to record some metal so the batteries can last a little bit longer and it doesn't really matter anymore nowadays because it's very hard to find metal tapes and since you can play them back and record to chrome and ferric that's pretty much all you need in a deck nowadays and then when it comes to playing back tapes this diminutive little machine puts in an excellent performance whether it's tape type one two three or four as long as the original recording was done to a high standard this thing will reproduce a sound the kind of which you don't even tend to get out of most home hi-fi decks and it looks good while it's doing it i'm a sucker for these bouncing vu needles I'll also point out that the left hand one is a battery indicator. If you press this button you can see the needle stays in position to show you how much battery power you've got left in there. And it also turns on a little backlight although it is quite dim as you can see here and it's only on momentarily. Once you've used this machine for a while, you really start to get an appreciation for some of the finer details, little basic things like this eject button here. All it is is a simple lever that's designed to pop the cassettes out of the machine, but it's just such a simple little mechanism that works. Why bother doing anything different? Now, of course, if you're playing back any music through this, you don't want to be doing it through that built-in speaker because it's just a tiny little speaker that's designed so you can tell that there's something on the tape. You really want to plug it into some sort of external amplifier or you can just plug those RCA plugs into external powered speakers like I've got here and it makes a heck of a difference. One reason I use this machine when I was demonstrating the Atari Video Music the other week is because you can have two live audio outputs at the same time. So I could plug the RCA outputs into the Atari and the headphone output came out of the front and into the camera that I was recording everything with. Talking of recording, you've got a record level dial here made out of metal. It's sort of gun metal in a way. The whole thing feels a little bit military at times. It's just so well put together. But as you can see, you can adjust the left and right separately. And of course, during interviews, they might have had one microphone for one person and one for the other and you could have adjusted the levels however if you want to plug something into this you can get a lead which will convert rca into microphone balanced xlr inputs however once you plug those into an output say from a line out from a cd player like i'm doing here and then plug the other end into the d5 you find that line level outputs are a lot hotter a lot louder than microphone level so that if I put pause on here and press record you can see that it's just peaking the whole thing out completely we've got the peak light shining at the top there as well next to the record light you can see if I just turn it up slightly it's just straight into the peak so uh, the line level output needs to be brought down to the level of a mic level input Fortunately, they've got this switch on the side here which takes 20 decibels off it so if we do that we can see we can bring it down here to a level that the device is supposed to record at now i'm not sure whether i'm supposed to be doing it this way but it does seem to work fine so uh, i'm just going to carry on but yeah you've also got a limiter at the bottom right notice if i turn this all the way up we have it so it's peaking out turn the limiter on and it will try and keep it back within normal recording level parameters that's for if you're at some sort of loud concert or somewhere where there's going to be loud noises every now and then you want to just to limit those so it didn't oversaturate the recording you might have noticed that my machine is in really good condition in fact the only marks on it are these little two scratches on the top here of the black paint but that's it and the reason that it's in such good condition is because it was kept in its protective case that's one of the great things about field recorders they all came with one of these protective cases so as long as the person that owned it before you kept it in there there's a good chance that it won't have got these scratches and marks that something of this age would usually have by now as you can see once you put it inside the case the original strap connectors go through holes in there and then your strap is supposed to attach to the connectors on the case itself my case has got a few scratches and nicks in it the leather's started to peel away in places but it's done its job it's protected the machine in fact you could even replace the cassettes inside the deck without taking it out of the case the only thing you need to take it out for really is to replace the batteries now, while Sony might have had the D5 on the market longer than any other rival model, there were quite a few other machines came and went during its lifetime from a number of different manufacturers. One of the more respected of those was Marantz, and this model here does bear quite a striking resemblance to the D5 in places. The model is the CP430. That's the European model number. In the US, it was known as the PMD430. It does Dolby B, but it also does 
DBX. This is the only DBX machine I've got. I only picked this up a couple of weeks ago. It's quite high end. It does uh, chrome and metal recording as well. And you can see down at the bottom here, we've got a pitch and a bias control on there. And it's also a three head machine. So that means I can listen back to the recordings that it's making as it's making them. And you just press that button down there to listen to either the tape or the source. So when it comes to features, it appears that this device has the Sony beaten hands down. However, when it comes to build quality, the Sony is clearly the victor. Where the Sony's got a solid metal construction, this has a flimsy, creaky plastic one. The Sony feels like a metal brick, this feels like an empty plastic box. And after reading up a little bit online, it seems like the wow and flutter numbers aren't that impressive for this machine either. Something else I learned while I was doing a bit of research for this video, you know earlier on I mentioned the BBC used these reel-to-reel -reel UF4400 recorders, I've even seen those for sale on eBay saying XBBC and they've got all the stamps and things on them. Well, when they replaced those, they didn't use the D5, no, instead they used its smaller, newer brother, the Sony D6C, which is classed as a professional Walkman, but really it's a very sophisticated little portable recorder, able to record using Dolby C and record on to metal, both things that I can't do with my D5. But I will talk more about the D6C in a future video. I plan on doing a video where I talk about Walkman and I'll feature it in that one. But getting back to the D5, I think it's time to do the wrap up. There are still plenty of people out there that for one reason or another need a decent quality cassette deck. But if you go looking to buy a new one nowadays, there's very little choice. You've got your cheap plasticky novelties, the things that convert tapes to MP3s. And one of the things that people have asked me to review a lot is the elbow cassette player, but that's just a design concept at the moment. It's pretend it's like a concept car at a motor show. You can't buy it. And whether or not anything like that will ever come to the market in the future, we'll just have to wait and see on that one. As far as things that you can go in a real shop somewhere in the world and buy, well, in the US, you can go and get the Tascam CDA580. That costs $400 over there, and it doesn't have any kind of Dolby noise reduction circuitry, and I'd imagine that's perhaps down to some sort of licensing issues. My preference, though, would be to go for something older. But even if you go back to 1990, you're still talking 27 years old, so you've got to buy something that was top quality back in the day if it's going to be working perfectly nowadays and uh, you won't get much better quality than one of these things. Now they quite often get overlooked when it comes to sort of second-hand tape players because they don't look particularly impressive. Once they're in the case it could be some sort of dictation machine or something and if you just search for portable cassette recorder you'll get a big list of uh, rubbishy things popping up. You need to know the model numbers so what I've done I've put some model numbers in the video description of ones that you could search for which might point you in the right direction but uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this video and as always thanks for watching. Oh, tapes. I was glad when those things died off. Good riddance. Why do you keep watching videos about things that you don't like and then complain about them? Because I need to let these idiots know that they're listening to music the wrong way. I don't understand why you feel threatened every time somebody does something different to you. I don't. I'm helping them out by informing them 
that there are better options. Just like yesterday, when you saw that person riding a horse and you shouted, get a car. Exactly. A car is better than a horse and streaming music is better than listening to a tape. Well, rather than complaining, instead, why don't you make your own video explaining how great streaming music is? That's not a bad idea. OK, let's pretend this is the video now. So, three, two, one, action. Oh, um, hey, what's up there, YouTube? Listen, guys, in this video, I'm going to be telling all you cassette users about a new thing called streaming music. Good, keep going. Oh, um, well, with streaming music, you can pick any record you like, listen back to the music uh, anytime you want. Um, it's, it's music. It's re really good. You suck. What? I'm just playing the part of you. Carry on. All oh, right, um, streaming music is really cheap and it doesn't get stuck in your machine. Just like every tape does, every time you play it. Boo! This is rubbish! Everyone knows about streaming, and you know sounds blocked. You're a moron, and this video stinks! Um, and if you stream, you'll be doing what everyone else does. So you'll be normal, and you won't have to store all those records and tapes and things. So what if I already use streaming music, but I also collect records and tapes? Uh, you need to stop doing what you enjoy and do what I want you to do. And then I'll feel happier about the choices that I've made. OK, wrap it up now. Right, um, that's it, you guys out there in YouTube land for this week. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thumbs down, unsubscribed and scene. I thought that went really well.